Good, good afternoon everyone. Thank you Mr. Vijayan for the invitation and the kind introduction. Uh, like you said, my name is Tavitra. I have a PhD in uh, studying coronaviruses. I studied it for about seven years and at that point it was a really boring virus. Nobody cared about it. And when I did my PhD, I was like, who is going to care about this virus? And all of a sudden now it is making news every single day. I studied one tiny aspect of the virus, which I'll briefly take you through. Uh, my journey to giving this lecture started because this, this coronavirus came up in the news and there were all these forwards about what you can do to stop this infection and 100% of them was rubbish. So I spoke to a small group of my friends and I said, yes, do you think you would be interested in listening to a technical scientific talk about this? And they said, yes. I was practicing for this talk at home and my father said, you talk to my college friends about this. So last Sunday morning or two Sundays back, I gave a lecture from for classmates of CG71. And one person from there, Mr. Swamitra Kumar, introduced me to Mr. Vijayan and here I am today giving this talk in front of you. My talk is broadly divided into three parts. The first part is fairly technical because I wasn't sure what the audience was going to be like. I try, try to break it down into layman terms as much as possible. Please note down any questions and be happy to answer them later. If you find the technical stuff too boring, don't worry about it. You will still be able to understand the rest of the lecture as it proceeds. The second part of the lecture is what is coronavirus, what we know about it, thank you. And um, what the historically how it's evolved and things like that. The last portion is data and analysis of what is happening with this outbreak. So this is how the lecture is broken down. So I'll get started right here. My first slide is actually a very philosophical question. What is life? When we look at what is life, the scientific definition is something that likes to replicate, make more copies of itself. The domains of life are divided into three. Bacteria, which we are all very familiar with. It causes a lot of infections, it does a lot of useful things, it's just around. Archaea, we don't talk a lot about it, but it is also a single cell organism that is found in places that have extreme conditions like high temperature, high sulfur conditions and things like that. The third is eukarya, which is everything from amoeba to fungi to cats, dogs and you and me. If you notice, I have not mentioned viruses in this because viruses are very unique and very exciting. They only replicate if they are inside something. If I have a bottle of coronavirus on this table, it's not going to do anything. It's not living at this point. But if it is getting into the host into which it can multiply, that is if it can infect something, then it becomes living. So viruses are a very unique branch of life under a, a, a somewhat shady definition, if you want to call it that. Now, the other aspect you need to remember is there is something called a central dogma of life. Every life follows this flow chart. We have our DNA, all of us have it in ourselves. It's a very popular term that everybody knows. So that is basically, when you go to an architect, if I break it down, the architect, you go tell them what you want, they'll give you a big drawing with a house, Clouds, three windows, doors, and everything. It contains a lot of information. That is our DNA. But then you cannot build anything with that rendering. The architect has to give you the electrical drawing, the plumbing lines, where the switch points are, where the floor is. That's what your RNA is. It only has the succinct information that's needed for building. So the mRNA is only containing information that is. Uh, uh, important. It doesn't have any of the frill uh, details. So every cell has DNA which is converted to RNA and then the contractor builds the structure and that is the protein. So protein is what we are all made of. So this is what happens in life. All, all of life. Again, viruses are very interesting, especially coronaviruses. They have no DNA. In their life cycle, they don't see DNA at all. It is what is called an RNA virus. The virus carries exactly what the information it needs to make more copies of its own. Carrying DNA and then carrying RNA is too much for it, so it only carries RNA. This is what makes one of the things that makes coronavirus quite interesting. This is 
what a schematic of coronavirus looks like. So, this ball shaped structure is the envelope or it's the bag. Inside is the RNA. It's stabilized by one protein called N, which is called nucleocapsid. Basically, it binds the RNA and stabilizes it. Then, in the bag, the envelope, there are multiple proteins. You see these big ones? They are called spike proteins. If you can imagine, it looks like a crown around the virus. In Latin, for crown is corona. That's why this virus is called a coronavirus. This is an electron micrograph of SARS coronavirus that I took in 2008. So this is what it looks like beautiful. Here is the envelope, here is the inside, here is the spike protein all around it. I actually studied this tiny little protein called envelope protein which really does nothing uh, it, because if you remove it from the virus, the virus still survives. So anyway, what the coronavirus does is, like I said, you have what is called cellular mRNA. The cell has DNA, then you have mRNA which is what is used to make the protein. The genome of coronavirus looks exactly like an mRNA. That's what makes it very exciting. What happens is, the spike protein which we saw that looks like the crown binds to molecules on a cell surface. There are many molecules on a cell surface that the cell needs for its own function. There is no molecule on any cell surface that is only available for a virus infection. These molecules on cell surface can be of can serve many purposes. Can be a signaling molecule, can be a transport molecule, we don't know what it could be. This spike protein will bind one of these molecules and then the cell will take the virus in thinking something has come using the cellular process itself. And once the virus enters the cell, you see the genome looks exactly like the mRNA. So the cellular machinery will simply think, oh, here is one more mRNA, let me make all the proteins. So the cellular mRNA, the cellular protein translation mechanism will make all the proteins that are needed to make the virus. And this virus will assemble in what is called the ER Golgi intermediate compartment. Again, very technical, if you don't understand, don't worry about it, but the people that know these terms will know what I'm referring to. ER is where the proteins are synthesized. Ergic is the region where the proteins are mature. Golgi and the uh, exocytic uh, process is how the viruses are released from the cell. And once the virus is released from the cell, it goes and infects the next cell. So this is what the virus life cycle looks like. Now, coronaviruses have been known from the 1950s. 1950s was a very interesting time for virology because electron microscopy was doing really well at that point and people learned how to stain biological molecules. You stain biological molecules by adding heavy metals like uranium to it and stabilize them and freezing them. So what they did was they would take any infectious sample uh, phlegm, earwax, blood, nose, urine, sputum, semen, anything. And then stain it and look under the electron microscope. So this is how they came across a lot of viruses. And we have coronaviruses infecting a whole range of animals and humans. Uh, we have them infecting pigs, dogs, rabbits, mouse, chicken, turkey, camels, any of them. So you can find a coronavirus infecting any host. And they cause a variety of infections. It doesn't always have to be respiratory. In humans, it predominantly seems like most of the coronaviruses cause respiratory infections. In animals, you have infections that are endemic. That is, the animals will get uh, loose motion and they will dehydrate and they will die. So if there is someone that has a chicken farm or a pig farm, they tell you to maintain high standards because if the chicken or the pigs get any of these viruses, your entire farm can be wiped out. Uh, the same with mice as well, and you can have liver-based infection as well. Sometimes the viral infections can even be neurologic. The rabbit coronavirus is actually really sad. You can see the virus infecting the animal, and the animal will slowly become more and more paralyzed and it will die because it can no longer breathe. Now, there are a lot of notable human coronavirus infections. Just by a show of hand, before the SARS coronavirus that came in 2002, how many of you have heard of a coronavirus? Just, just one maybe? One, oh, yeah, I know you're in Dubai. Actually, 30%, one in three 
common cold is caused by coronavirus. It may, for the majority of the time, it causes very flu-like symptoms, very cold and cough symptoms. This, the doctor will say it's a viral panic and it will be a cold. That's what it causes. In fact, all these coronaviruses have been discovered in the last 20 years. NL63 was in Netherlands. Uh, uh, HCOV229 was South America. OC43, I think, was Europe. HKU1 was Hong Kong. And then we of course know SARS that came out uh, out of China. And then we have MERS that came out of Middle East. And for the most part, if you see, we've been able to trace the origin to an intermediate or a primary natural host. For some reason, mice and bats carry a lot of coronaviruses without showing any symptoms, without actually having any infection. And how we think these infections happen is, it's only by chance. Everybody says, oh, China, they're eating all these animals. That's why we get these infections. It's not actually the case because they just happen to have a lot more exposure to it. If you think about it, we had a Nipah virus outbreak two, two and a half years back. Doesn't mean we were eating bats. We were just exposed to it and by chance the virus was able to go from the animal to the human and mutate from the human to human transmission was possible. So we don't know, we think the primary host for this new coronavirus, SARS coronavirus 2 was bats. We don't know if there is an intermediate host just yet. So this is the technical parts of the coronavirus. Now we talk about the epidemic. This virus is now called SARS coronavirus 2. I will not be referring it to referring to it by any other name. It started in this province, Wuhan, in China. It's very, very detrimental to call the virus as Wuhan coronavirus because we humans have a tendency to be prejudicial. If I look at a Chinese person sneezing, you will say, yeah, he has a coronavirus. He will not even be Chinese, he will be not Eastern Indian. So when they name viruses, they actually take care not to have a geographical or a racial or a cultural link to it because we humans have a tendency to be biased against anything that comes like that. So this virus is SARS coronavirus 2. It's a previously undiscovered virus. And the source, we don't know. It could be bats, it could be civet cats, we don't know. How does the virus spread? We actually don't know how the virus spreads from person to person. Just by looking at the pattern of spread, people are guessing. By people, I mean not you and me. People at CDC and WHO are suggesting that it's a droplet transmission. That is, from uh, phlegm, saliva and all that. And the symptoms, all the people that have been tested, please note, have either had a direct link to the place or they have symptoms. The symptoms are similar to cold. And if the person has any underlying conditions like diabetes or uh, kidney function problems, then it causes severe complications. One very interesting aspect to note that children under 5 have extremely mild symptoms. We don't know why that is. Usually children under 5 can actually have very, very severe reactions to something like you, but with this virus, it has not happened. We don't know why that is. And as we progress further, there are a lot of terms that are being thrown around here. And most of the news we see are flashy and just to catch your attention. But that's not where we get our scientific information from. So I'll be going through some technical terms so that everybody is on the same page as we talk. Uh, what is an outbreak? We say, is this an outbreak? Is it an epidemic? Is it an endemic? Is it pandemic? We don't know. An outbreak is an infection identified in a small geographic location. An epidemic is slightly larger than an outbreak. Nipah virus was an outbreak. This, we thought until my last talk two weeks back was an epidemic. But now it's going towards what is called a pandemic. Meaning it, spread, it has and will continue to spread worldwide. Patient zero. The first patient to have gotten an infection from and how they got it. That is what is called patient zero. There is a lot of news about this patient zero consuming a back soup. There is no actual scientific evidence of it. The other thing that people love to talk about is the case fatality ratio. That is the number of people that have died by the, divided by the number of people that have the infection times 100. That is the case fatality ratio. And it's usually determined at the end of an epidemic. Keep in mind, 
we are very much in the middle of the epidemic, so the case fatality ratio is not something that we don't know yet. We are all guessing this number. Prevalence is actual number of people infected. That is very hard to determine because we are only testing people that have direct contact or have symptoms. We actually don't know how many people have been infected. We don't know how many people have no symptoms. We don't know how many people just had a one day, half a day's fever and nothing came out of that. So we can get this data only at the end of the epidemic. And R0 is a, is a mathematical term to find out the number of people one infected person can infect. A virus infection control can be done if the R0 is less than 1. That is, if I am infected, if I am infecting one more person and that person infects one more person, the virus, the number of people infected will remain stable. If R0 is greater than 1, the number of infected cases will go up. If R0 is less than 1, the number of infected cases will go down. For this virus, okay, yeah, then I can ask some basic questions. Is coronavirus, is COVID-2019, that's the name of the infection caused by SARS-CoV-2. It started off as an outbreak, it's now an epidemic, it looks like it will become a pandemic. WHO has still not said that it is a pandemic, it, it, it looks like it will become a pandemic. Who is patient zero? We don't know. And does it matter? Yes. Because we want to know when the original infection started. We discovered this infection on December 31st. How, many, how long has this infection been in circulation? That's why it's important to know who the patient zero was and how long they have been spreading that disease, who all they have been in contact with. Now, they have not been able to identify this person, but they have identified based on gene sequence data that the first infection probably occurred around December 8th. If you think about it, this is phenomenal information that we have been able to process in such a short time. It has taken us less than one and a half months to collect the virus samples, grow it and sequence it and study and see how it has evolved from the beginning. This is just phenomenal information because what they are doing now, it took me five years to do. And this was not very long ago, I graduated only in 2012. So we now have this power to tra trace, track and follow infections very closely. How prevalent is the information? We don't know. Surveillance techniques only focus on people with, people with symptoms and people who have had a direct connection with Hubei province. What about others? The only way we can get a sample is, for example, people have been evacuated by other countries. In those people, they test everybody. They test everybody to see whether they have the virus or not. We actually have to collect that information to find out how many people carry the virus. Because you can carry the virus and not can have any symptoms. We also don't know whether this virus can be uh, spread if the person doesn't have any symptoms. What is the R0 for this virus? As of now, it's been estimated to be around 2.6. That is, every infected person can spread it to 2.5 people. Just to compare, the flu virus spreads about R0 is a little over 1. It's not exactly 1, it's a little over 1. That's why the infection continues to happen. Before the polio vaccine was invented, R0 for polio was 6. That's why polio was so prevalent. Now some of the facts are, this was a map that CDC had put up day before yesterday. It's outdated now. 50 countries were infected. 50 countries had cases with infection. And these were the number of cases. The bigger the dot is, the more number of cases there are. This morning, I was like, let me just refresh my information and see if it's correct. And WHO has updated yesterday. One more country has been added to this. This is very interesting because the new country added was Nigeria. And there's an Italian patient there, there's a person of Italian origin who has been infected. What is more interesting is we actually don't know if this person has had any contact with anybody that has been in the Hubei province. So we don't know how he got infected. Did he travel before this happened? How long was the incubation time? We don't know any of these. Now, WHO has called it a public health emergency of international concern, which means it's inviting governments from everywhere to collaborate and contain this infection. As of yesterday, this is the count. 83,652 people have been confirmed as infected according to current surveillance. The total number of deaths directly attributed to COVID-2019 is 3,038 
and the estimated case fatality rate like i said based on just these two numbers it's 3.6 percent before we all panic and think oh my god this is scary, scary so many people have died just think about it there has always been periodic coronavirus outbreaks the last 20 years i have shown you six coronavirus outbreaks and this is the first time we are able to detect diagnose track treat and prevent we, if at all, we are at the best time to be able to control this infection. If you see MERS, which came out in 2012, I think, 34.1% uh, uh, mortality rate. I think that is the current number. It's not estimated. SARS itself was 10%. So, you may ask, how are they able to control those infections but this seems to be spreading? This took nine months to control even now we get few cases of this. It's not exactly controlled. And SARS was very easy to control because people were able, people were only spreading the infection when they were when they had symptoms. So it was very easy to, easy to isolate and keep them. This is still a challenge for this virus. There, so when you come to see what can you do about it, what are the facts? There is no vaccine and there is no approved medications to treat it. And WHO risk assessment has just gone up. For China, is very high. Regional level is very high. Global level is very high. This is how it stands currently. This is not to say that you should panic or not panic. This is just the fact of the matter. Things that don't work. None of these work. You cannot take antibiotics for a viral infection. Garlic soap is great, but it's not going to do anything for you. Homeopathy, Yunani doesn't work. Please don't take arsenic tablets because... Arsenic will kill the viral infection, but it will kill the viral infection by killing you. Arsenic is extremely poisonous. Please, please don't consume feces of any animal. It's not going to help you. And WhatsApp is not a reliable source. So what should you do? Non-pharmaceutical interventions would be the most important strategy. Non-pharmaceutical interventions sounds very fancy. It's actually what we always know. Living in India, say Namaste. Shaking hands is one of the worst ways that we can transmit disease from one person to another. If uh, you can avoid crowds, avoid crowds. Wa wash your hands. Nothing will prevent infections as compared to washing your hands. We actually touch our face about 20 times per minute without realizing. That is one of the fastest ways to get an infection because we have mucosal tissue in our eye, nose, mouth, everywhere. So it's very easy to catch an infection that way. Wash your hands, keep your hands clean, try not to touch your face. Avoid unnecessary travel plans and crowds. I was just joking to uh, uh, Govind Rajan sir that maybe we shouldn't be gathered here because it's a crowded room with some closely circulating air. But they're probably okay. If you are wearing a mask, the blue surgical mask does nothing. It just makes you uncomfortable. If you want to wear a mask to prevent an infection, wear an N95 respirator. Learn to use it properly. N95 respirators make you extremely uncomfortable. So if you're going to be removing, putting it, removing, putting it, removing, putting it, you might as well not wear it. If you get, if you have symptoms, go to a doctor and get treated. Be aware that living in India, you're more likely to ex be exposed to diseases like malaria, dengue, and flu through the rest of the year. And those are extremely scary infections as well. Please don't panic about one infection that we don't know much about. Get your information from reliable sources. WHO.int and CDC.gov are some of the best websites you can go to. It sounds very technical and fancy, but all their write-ups are extremely simple. Every lay person can understand what's on those websites. What about the future? So, this talk is very interesting because I've given three talks and each of these talks I've been talking about a different future. The first talk, I thought it would probably die down soon, which doesn't look like it's happening. It might become seasonal like the flu, which it might, we don't know. Right now, it's still colder in a lot of the places and air droplet infections do spread during colder weather because the air is drier, droplets hang in the air for a long time and go from one person to another. So we just have to see this. COVID-19 becomes a pandemic. Now, it looks like we are very close to COVID becoming a pandemic because so many countries are having it, so many countries are having it 
and we just have to accept that it is heading worldwide. And that's it. This is my lab, and I just want to market it. Thank you.